Looking back on earlier portions of one's life, one is surprised by the turns it has taken. Things and events no imagination could have predicted unfold in a seemingly random manner, leading to equally unexpected and improbable results, like pinballs in one of those arcade games we bang into things and ricochet off in unanticipated directions. Detours become highways. I certainly could never have anticipated my involvement with the Star Trek series, let alone where that involvement would lead. Had time after time been a bigger hit, I might have got my shot at fifth business. But it wasn't, and I didn't. In the meanwhile, the film had netted me Hollywood's then Uber agent, Stan Kamen, who called and said he wanted to represent me. I responded that he wouldn't when he heard that there was only one project in which I was interested. Agents must be used to all sorts of quaint notions and obsessions from clients, and mine didn't appear to faze him. Agents know how to wait. Cayman would patiently send me scripts. I would send them back. Time passed. I sat in my house and went to meetings only if they involved conjuring, the screen name for fifth business. Months became years. I met with all sorts of people, but conjuring stubbornly resisted my efforts to give it life. I got all sorts of advice, including of the make it one for them, something commercial, again that word, and then you can get your film financed, bromide. It was on a Sunday afternoon in early 1982, and I was barbecuing hamburgers with a childhood friend, Karen Moore, now, that is, then, an executive at Paramount, when she gave me a piece of blunt advice. Nikki, if you want to learn how to direct, you should direct and not sit up here holding your breath because you're not getting to make the film you want. Had this counsel come unsolicited from, say, my parents, I doubt I would have paid it heed. But originating in a disinterested friend, it resonated, especially when she followed it up with, why don't you sit down with Harve Bennett over at Paramount? He's in charge of producing the next Star Trek movie, and I think you'd like him. I must have stared at her. Star Trek? Is that the one with a guy with pointy ears? My experience of and exposure to the series had been limited to my Iowa City friend, and since then had consisted only of seeing those ears flash by when channel surfing. One look and I kept going. The whole idea that, contrary to all scientific understanding and evidence to date, the cosmos was filled with other life forms, most of them walking around on two legs, speaking English, and always landing on planets with breathable air, seemed utterly absurd to me. You'll like him, Karen insisted, meaning Bennett, not Spock. With her earlier advice still ringing in my ears, I agreed to meet the man. Each of Hollywood's studio lots has its own personality and feel. Warner is perhaps the most attractive, with a gardened, country club sort of atmosphere. Universal most resembles a factory, while Fox and MGM are shadows of what they once were. Most of Fox's territory is now occupied by the high-rise office buildings known as Century City, while MGM, in some sort of irony, is now the home of another company entirely, Columbia, in turn owned by Sony, once known due to its puny size as Columbia the germ of the ocean. The Paramount lot was the most Hollywood of the bunch, due to its location in the heart of that zip code, even though it shared space, eerily enough, with a cemetery. Aside from a western street and some New York facades, there never had been a real back lot. Exteriors had typically utilized the Paramount Ranch in Agura. In fact, the smallish studio had actually been cobbled together from Paramount and what was formerly RKO, before it had been bought by Lucille Ball and turned into something called Desi Lu, combining Lucy's name with that of her Cuban husband, Desi Arnaz.